Greetings, Baker Economics students. I'm Joe Barnhill, be your instructor for the next uh, seven weeks. So I want to say that I'm looking forward to working with you all over this time period. Uh, hope everybody had a great holidays and a happy new year. Uh, it is now January 1st, 2023, uh, and hard to believe, but uh, coming to you from uh, Lee Summit, Missouri. So I, I like to post these mini lectures every week to give you some insights about what's happening in the economy, about um, guidance through the week for uh, expectations, and uh, yeah, it'll give you a little bit of the insights to the way to approach economics. So I uh, usually try to keep these to about 10 minutes, so I try to keep them brief. But know that you can always reach out to me via email if you have questions. Uh, first, just want to go through some of the things in the syllabus. Uh, obviously, with the forum discussions, that's a big part of our course. Uh, you know, try to tie in current events, what's going on. When I think about current events today, I think about the uh, Southwest uh, fiasco. And uh, this is a good example. I also teach project management. I'm going to bring this up to my project management kids. I, I work full time at State Tech in uh, Lynn, Missouri, but I uh, come home on the weekends uh, to Lee Summit, Missouri. But uh, just a total disaster of lack of uh, having good software in place and scheduling systems. So Southwest is going to have to invest a lot of capital into um, revamping their entire reservation system to deal with contingencies. So definitely a problem that they had, but this is also going to probably impact the demand for Southwest in the future, you would think, because they're becoming a less reliable airline, especially if weather conditions go bad. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to um, stock prices Southwest and how they'll recover from this. They've, they've done, they've, they're a pretty solid company. They've done well over the long run, so who knows? Maybe people get over it and forget about it, and uh, maybe they'll be off for the right deals or the right pricing strategies uh, to help them move forward. But anyway, for the forum discussions, uh, do look at the forum discussion rubric. The expectation is that you post by Thursday, by midnight, and then to at least one period by Saturday. Um, I, I do this to you know, not have people just posting at Sunday at midnight. It really needs to be an interactive inter, um, engagement. And I will try to uh, jump in and respond to your forum post. I may not respond to everybody that week. There might be some weeks if I feel I have some time I can do that. But I'll try to get to like at least half and kind of take turns, but if I'm ambitious, I might get to everybody that week. But, uh, you know, at least jump in by that Thursday or jump in as soon as you feel comfortable, uh, get the form discussion going. Uh, you'll notice that you'll, we'll have quizzes in uh, the My Econ Lab in this course. So uh, there's a course, course, uh, course code out there, so take, take advantage of that and get those quizzes done. Uh, you also have a major research paper, uh, a task stream assignment. So make sure to read through that, but you're asked to pick a company or a specific industry. I would suggest more of the company. And uh, um, the librarian at Baker, she's done a great job, put some more resources out there, put kind of guide you in some potential resources to help find you some information about your papers. I'll talk more about the paper later in the course, uh, but definitely start looking at that, start gathering some ideas about which company you'd want to research. And I'd suggest for that paper, uh, it's obviously an APA paper, but uh, to help with transitions, you may have like just headings, and then when you could talk about like the government, that could be the heading you know, when you're addressing that particular question and go through your paragraph development uh, to answer those questions. So, all right, so a little bit of overview of the chapters that you'll be reading this week. Uh, the chapter one, uh, the premise of this is that people are rational. Uh, that not all economists agree that uh, people are rational. Some economists, behavioral economists, believe that people are, are irrational with their decisions. You know that uh, uh, there's such things as marketing, or um, that we are altruistic, or there's if you uh, I've had a finance course, you know, dealing with efficient market hypothesis. That you know why are there there's uh, sometimes anomalies in markets, or why did the subprime crisis happen, where people were bidding up prices on homes to irrational levels? So. Um, but so if you ever uh, looked into any behavioral economics, it is pretty interesting because uh, they do a lot of lab experiments, and they'll do something as simple as just put a wine bottle in front of you and ask you, you know, how much would you pay for this wine bottle? And then right before you do that, they asked you to um, put down the last two digits of your Social Security number. And what they found repeatedly over these experiments is that the people with very high last two digits Social Security uh, numbers pay more for the price of that wine. And it's something that's like an anchor. And that's a lot of times what marking does. If you ever been in a high V lately, I, I swear they, they pump that 80s music so loud. They're, they're addressing my generation. 
but it does have an impact on how much you buy so that they know there's little tweaks um, instead of people being rational just buying the groceries that you need uh, people tend to spend more than they would they would actually spend when they go in the grocery store so all right so with this you're also going to be uh, looking at people respond to economic incentives and I truly believe this uh, it's kind of a foundation of our economy and this is why our economy has done so much better and even like communist countries have adopted Western style economies uh, these things have to be in place um, you know other economies have tried different systems uh, where it's a state-run system, and it just does not work well. It doesn't mean that anyway we are a pure capitalist economy, but we are called a kind of a social capitalist economy. And uh, look at Europe, they're much more socialist, and they have higher tax structures and more government intervention. If you've been following the news, you know, uh, the whole Brexit and um, the Prime Minister of Brian, um, Great Britain, she lasted like 45 days with some of her... Uh, wild supply side economic ideas and they got rid of her pretty, pretty quickly but um, still intends you know it's kind of a, a debate which way we're going you know is it going to be more government intervention in markets which which to me can be a little bit concerning um, yes we need to have regulation but but to what degree there's going to be some incentives out there too and then the last is that, you know, chapter one, that optimal decisions are made at the margin. So when everybody's making a decision, you always think about the marginal benefit versus the marginal cost, you know. So um, obviously you guys are making a sacrifice right now, uh, working on um, a graduate degree. I admire you for that. Uh, it takes a lot of time and effort. I truly understand that. I just went through a doctorate program, uh, wrapped up about a year ago at KU. And it, trust me, it was a ton of work. So I, I know what you guys go through. So I appreciate what you do. And uh, you're going to deal with some other things in those chapters, get the idea of concept of opportunity cost. And finally, as we, we like to talk about opportunity cost, the weighted average cost of capital. But uh, you're also going to look at positive and normative economics. Positive are things that we can measure. Uh, we should expect through theory if the price of something goes up for the quantity of demand that goes down. Well, we can measure the unemployment rate or the inflation rate. And the inflation rate has been crazy. And that's why you've been seeing uh, interest rates go up by the Federal Reserve so much. We'll kind of look at that during our course, too, to see how much more they're going to raise interest rates. And uh, as interest rates gone up, we've seen bond prices and the price of bonds drop quite a bit. So these are positive things that we can measure. Not that it means that it's a good thing. It's just something we can measure. And the normative is what we should be doing. So uh, when people are criticizing the Federal Reserve about raising interest rates, a potential recession in 2023, that's an opinion. So uh, the Federal Reserve has to look at the, uh, the dual mandate of steady growth and steady employment. So they recognize that there's probably going to be some higher unemployment coming here this way uh, to try to get inflation in bay. And uh, inflation you do want to get in bay because it, it's just a transfer of wealth to other people. Uh, and it, it has serious implications for us because most of us are not going to get the 8 or 9% raise we're going to need to keep up with the standard of living. Uh, we're going to be much worse off um, during the coming year. So hopefully we're going to get that under control. Chapter 2, you're going to look at a little bit of comparative advantage, the idea of absolute advantage. Um, bottom line, trade is essential for economies. We would not enjoy the amount of goods and services that we have today, all the clothes and all the toys and everything you bought over the Christmas time period. Uh, would not have happened at the lower price without trade. Essentially, the idea is that even between two countries that may, one country may have an absolute advantage in doing it better in the production of a good or service, say, let's talk about like wine and chocolate. Um, no country is going to have a comparative advantage in both those goods. There's going to be opportunity costs and trade-offs to say that a country switches from producing chocolate, say you're Belgium and you go to wine, um, you're going to have to sacrifice maybe more and more chocolate each time. So you're going to look at that concept. And then finally, in Chapter 3, you're going to wrap up with a lot of the supply and demand analysis. Uh, I like, want you to think of it this way, that if it's a factor of uh, strictly price, it's just a movement along a supply curve or demand curve. But if it's a factor other than price, uh, that's what's going to shift that supply or demand curve. A lot of the chapter is going to look at say hey this scenario happens which did happen this year like the a lot of the orange trees were destroyed in florida that's going to be a supply curve shift in as a result uh, there's fewer oranges in the grocery store and orange juice is going to be a lot more expensive so you're going to go through those concepts but uh again if you do have any questions do email me i'm looking forward to working with you all i do have one other baker course they asked me to take on a small cohort so i, I will be pretty busy 
uh, this semester, but I will respond to you that day or the following day at the latest if you have a question. So otherwise, have a, a great Happy New Year, and I look forward to talking to you online in the forum discussions. Take care.